So right now at Brom, we have an exhibition up called Terra Ludus Playground, which looks at outdoor recreation in the high country. And walking is a huge part of outdoor recreation in the high country and of the recreation economy of Western North Carolina. Um, just every year, fly fishing and fishing license bring in over $400 million to the North Carolina economy. Uh, but the history of fly fishing is a rich and romantic culmination of woodsmen, artists, and literature, which lies at the heart of early American history. So um, today, we're lucky enough to have Fred Klein um, from Grizzly King Flies, and uh, his goal is to carry on the tradition of fly tying and fishing with wet flies, streamers, and dry flies from this golden era of fly fishing. Um, there are a number of talented contemporary fly tires that have pursued the classical tradition, and Fred's endeavor is to continue the traditional methods and pass them on to the next generation. So today it's going to be a little bit of art, a little bit of history, and some insight into fly tying and the people that fling them into the rivers. So we're really fortunate to have um, Fred Klein calling in from Pennsylvania today. So um, yeah, take it away, Fred. Well, thank you, Willard. Uh, thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to be, be part of what you're doing. And uh, we're going to talk today about the, the art and history of fly tying and the history of fly fishing, primarily in America. But we're going to get into some of the roots of fly fishing. <laughs> um, about myself, I live in, in uh, Pennsylvania, uh, the eastern part of Pennsylvania. We actually are in the Appalachian Mountain regions. Um, I grew up uh, in an old farmhouse on a big property. It was actually an old farm. Uh, and we had two ponds with, that were spring fed. And the, one of the ponds was loaded with brook trout. Uh, and a friend bought me a fly rod back in 75 or 76 and taught me how to cast. So I learned how to cast and catch trout on really beautiful brook trout which spoiled me at a, at a very young age and we had several streams and rivers right around our home that uh, I could walk to so I I grew up uh, in the woods and loving the outdoors uh, uh, fly fishing a lot uh, throughout my my whole life um, it was one of the things I enjoyed the most hunting did a lot of trapping uh, and then as I grew older I started to venture off into the Appalachian Mountain region deeper and deeper and just fell in love with the Appalachian Mountains here in Pennsylvania, which to me is, is just one of the beautiful, one of the most beautiful parts of our state. Um, and it really is endless because I, I've been a, a, a mountain wanderer for all my life and I've only scratched the surface and seeing the portions of it that are right around where I live. And we're, we're very fortunate here in Pennsylvania because we actually have the greatest amount of trout water and trout streams and rivers than any state in the lower 48. Um, everywhere we go, there's, there's a trout stream. There's cold, cold streams running out of the, the hills and mountains with brook trout. There's uh, great brown trout water. We have wild rainbow trout. It's, it's really uh, it's a beautiful area, so I'm fortunate. Um, and my focus is on uh, classic fly tying and, and uh, fly fishing with traditional equipment. Um, I started a long time ago when a lot of these flies were still very popular. As a matter of fact, I remember going into fly fishing uh, shops and they were still selling flies with silk gut, which is from a, a caterpillar's gut, uh, snells on the hooks. They, there were still people that, that were loyal to a, a silk snelled fly. And uh, so things have changed a lot since the 70s. Um, but today we're, we're going to talk about Fly fishing in America, the origins. Uh, but before we start about Europe, uh, let's get into just some basics of the, the very oldest 
acknowledgments of fly fishing and um, the ancient Romans fished. Uh, they were anglers and there are references to the Romans tying th uh, thread and fur around hooks and casting them to the, uh, the fish because they, they were replicating bugs. So that's, that's fly fishing. But we really cannot start a discussion on fly fishing in America without talking about our roots uh, of the sport, which, which come from England, Ireland, and Scotland. People have been fishing with the fly in Europe for a long, long time, and the uh, Great Britain really uh, were a huge part of that advancement of fly fishing, and it was quite popular in England and uh, Ireland, Scotland. There were several works of uh, literature. The oldest, the oldest work would be uh, Dame. Juliana Berners, she wrote uh, the Treaty of Fly Fishing with an Angle, uh, and that would have been 1460. And that's a long time ago, and the world was a very different place then. The population was much lower, and people were living more basic lives. But if you ever read literature from that era, you quickly realize these people um, were very, very bright people. And her book is actually very beautifully written. Uh, it, it contains a lot of detail. It gives us a, a a window into that time to see how people fly fished, uh, even as far as how they made hooks out of needles. Um, the rods they used, the uh, horsehair line that they would braid to, to cast. That's the oldest reference in literature because literature is really uh, our main window into the history of fly fishing uh, besides tradition and um, some remaining equipment which we may mainly find in museums literature is our is our gateway into the the past of fly fishing uh, the first major work uh, of literature on fly fishing was uh, from england uh, by Isaac Walton. I'm sure you've all heard of Isaac Walton. He's uh, one of the great authors of England and his his most beloved book was published in the uh, 1600s, 1653, called The Complete Angler in England, uh, which that book is a, really a celebration of the art and spirit of fly fishing written in verse and it's beautifully done and it's a favorite of many many today it's i believe it's one of the best selling books uh from great britain in the history of great britain um isaac walton um had a huge impact on fly fishing his focus was on the art and the poetry and it was it, it was uh, a way for him to get in touch with with uh nature and creation um, and it's just a beautifully written piece if you ever get a chance to read it or listen to it on audiobook then there was an earlier work which was not quite as extensive by john dennis in 1613 he wrote a book called the secrets of angling which was another book of poetry verse uh, on fly tying the techniques of fly fishing in great detail how to tie flies what materials were used it's really interesting to read the materials that were used back in those days, which a lot of them are very similar to what we use now, although they didn't have all the uh, the uh, man-made materials that we have in fly fishing now, and they would gather their materials to make flies based on what they could find in the field and hunting and on the farm. Uh, all different materials from pigs, to cows, to chickens, to uh, partridge, uh, deer, wolf, all kinds of really neat exotic things, but also they didn't have the game walls that we have now. And they would use uh, feathers from all different types of birds, seabirds and uh, raptors. It was, it's really interesting to read actually. Um, <clears throat> So John Dennis' book was another great work. That was in 1613. He talks and also gets into the details of the type of rods they used, which were bamboo and hardwood. 
um, the the uh, fly line that, that they use, which was horse hair braided together. Um, he talked about techniques on fly fishing where they would skate the fly across the water and keep it on the surface, which was essentially a dry fly in 1613. <laughs> the interesting thing about these authors from this time period, the time period of Shakespeare, uh, of Isaac Newton, um, of John Smith uh, and, and the new colony and, and the new world, this is all going on while, while this, this time period of fly fishing was happening. This would be what the headlines read of in that day. Um, these authors from that time period, uh, Isaac Walton and John, John Dennis, they, they both spoke of, of fly fishing. Uh, they called it angling. And they spoke of it as an ancient, timeless art form back then. So when we look back on the, our heritage as in the fly fishing world, and we think back as far as you know the Catskills and Ray Bergman and uh, some of the wet flies of the 20th century, uh, these folks were living back in the 1600s and speaking about the sport as if it were an ancient uh, form of, of, of art. So I believe it went back a long way and there's a lot of tradition there. Um, and they did look at it as an art because there were, of course, there were other types of angling, which would be bait and lures and such things. And um, they, they referenced fly fishing as being an art form and the gentleman's form of fishing. Uh, it's, it's really interesting. In, in Europe, England and Scotland, they really did refine fly fishing to an art um, long before uh, there was ever a thought of being a United States of America. So with the uh, adventure of the new world and immigrants coming from Europe to America, it wouldn't be hard to imagine that some of these folks that made the, uh, the voyage to America were motivated by things like, you know, virgin forest, uh, land for, for not very expensive, a lot of land to build your own farm, your own home. The hunting would have been uh, virgin forest with, uh, that had never seen a white, European or white Europeans gun. Uh, they're only the American Indians were here. So the uh, draw of, of rivers and streams and the ocean being full of unfished uh, waters was, was definitely a draw for a lot of the immigrants coming to America. And I, I believe a lot of them counted on it when they got here. So the, these refined uh, anglers from England, Ireland, and Scotland came to America with loaded with uh, a lot of tradition, experience, equipment, and prepared to, to, to fly fish in the, the new world. So it's really interesting. When fly fishermen arrived in America, they found the wilderness, true wilderness. Uh, the streams and rivers in the United States were much different than the chalk streams and the slower moving water of, of Great Britain. And they found a much more robust uh, river and stream system full of wild fish. Now, when the, the, the immigrants came to America, they settled primarily in the beginning in the northeastern part of the country. Uh, the waters in, in this part of the country would have been full of salmon, uh, brook trout, uh, for the most part it would have been brook trout. Brown trout were not introduced until many years later in the late 1800s. Um, so the rivers and streams were, were teeming with, with fish. Uh, and they realized that the techniques used in, in Europe uh, 
didn't work quite as well here in the United States. So the American anglers started to develop their own traditions and techniques for fishing, including flies, and they started building rods. In the beginning, all the equipment would come as if, as everything else from Europe. If you wanted to buy silk for tying flies, you would have ordered it from, from England. Um, if you would have if you would have wanted to purchase a reel, it would have come from England or a fly vice or hooks. Uh, a lot of the a lot of the hooks that are popular uh, were originated in, in in England, so they would sh have them shipped in. And Americans started to create their own items at home. And then in time, it did become a commercial entity in the United States where America started building fly rods, flies, and equipment their way, which was different than, than Europe. But mainly the flies started to change to suit fishermen in uh, the United States versus fishermen in, in England. But many of the great and, and still very popular fly patterns that we see and we use here today contemporarily in, in the United States and all over the world originated in England. There's a few that you might know the names of, the Grizzly King, uh, the Professor, the Coachman. Uh, I just recently finished an article on a fly called the Cocky Bondi. And the Cocky Bondi is a simple a uh, peacock body with a brown hurl hackle. Uh, it's actually a uh, furnace rooster hackle. This fly has been named in just about every work of literature from modern times. It still remains a favorite fly because it works. And dating back into the, uh, the early 1600s. Uh, so it's a it's a fly that that came from Europe and it's still it's still quite popular and a very simple fly. Um, so a lot of the fly patterns that we have today were originated in England, and there's stories that go along with all those. Many of the hooks and and uh, the hook patterns and hook bends that we use today were created in in England, Ireland, and Scotland. So we started here in America with a basis of what Europe had already refined to a, a science. And they truly did. When you, when you read the, the books from, from that back in the day, it's amazing how uh, complex and uh, intuitive the anglers were. And, and they, they really did have fly fishing down to a science at that point. Um, so, this is how the, the American fly fishing experience began. Um, I, there were wild streams everywhere, but we were somewhat restricted by travel because uh, before the railroad, all travel was, was uh, carried out by horse, carriage, and boats. So people really couldn't travel that far until the railroad was built. Um, so as the, the American fly fishing uh, experience grew and, and evolved, um, we come to the first work of literature in the United States by a man named Thaddeus Norris. Uh, he was born in 1811 and died in 1877. Um, he was he was nicknamed the American Walton. Uh, his book, the American Angler's Book, which he wrote in 1864 in Philadelphia, um, is a book brought together because he saw the need to write a book on the American fly fishing experience. All other books be before this were written in Europe. Um, and he did that, and he was a very, very educated, very well-spoken, very uh, uh, well-written man, and he, he created this first work in America. Um, the book is really tremendous. Even as, as contemporary fly fishermen, we have so much that we can learn from these people, and um, it's, it's quite impressive. He wrote <clears throat> about the time, which was 1864. 
um, he wrote, we can really see what, uh, what it was like fly fishing in America in the time of the, the, the American Civil War. And uh, he wrote a lot about the fish species that were, that were here, um, the wild trout, the, uh, how plentiful they were. Um, he wrote about the, the ecosystems found in the area. Now his base was out of Philadelphia, but he traveled extensively even for that time period, which would have been on horse most of his life. Um, which is really impressive. Um, it takes a lot of passion to travel so far as he did um, on horseback to, to fly fish. Um, and when his book came out, that was around the advent of the railroad and the tracks were going in, which would, which would really increase the, the ability for Americans to experience fly fishing in different regions of the country. Uh, the Catskills, Vermont, the Beaver Kill, New Hampshire, Maine, even out to the Rocky Mountains. Thaddeus Norrisall need to write a book on the American fly fishing experience. He wrote about all the details from pollution at the time that was happening, and he did talk about mass pollution uh, in 1860s uh, along whole riverways that were wiped out, industry that built along rivers and dumped chemicals into rivers and uh, he was he was very focused and he gives you the idea that a lot of people were very concerned and focused about the ecosystem and trout habitat even back then and they started to fight it there were government entities on philadelphia that were writing laws and uh, arresting people for trapping fish and polluting the water even back as far as the 1700s he wrote about flies uh, the vice the flyers used the materials hooks uh, silk silk gut and how to use the silk gut. See, back in those days, uh, they didn't have nylon fishing line. Uh, they had silk and it was actually the silk gut out of a caterpillar's stomach from China, just like the old silk. And it was, uh, that was the means of, of making fishing line. It was relatively clear and it had to be wet and softened before you could use it. Um, but he did talk about flies and we have a, a little glimpse into some of the flies that were popular in the 1800s uh, but he didn't have many they had some salmon and trout flies and detailed instructions about how to tie them uh, with some illustrations and there was there were only four salmon flies and nine, nine trout flies which were mainly nymph type flies with hackle wrapped around the uh, head and a few wings but they were very simple although uh, very effective. If you take his patterns and tie them and take them out to a trout stream, you'll do very well. Um, very simple, uh, but with natural materials and beautiful. So this was the first work of literature in American fly fishing, and it was really a great work of literature, poetic and beautifully written. Um, still very educational for today's fly fishermen. I think any, any fly fisherman would be very pleased with with uh, the education they would could walk away with from that from that old book. Then Thaddeus Norris went on to build a uh, fly rod and reel company in Philadelphia, and actually wrote several other books. And they were about fly fishing and also about the uh, the environment and 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 trout uh, habitat. He was he was definitely an environmentalist. The next great work of literature was uh, Charles Orvis, and I'm sure you're all aware of the Orvis Company. Uh, Charles Orvis was really the, the uh, father of that company. He was born in 1831 and lived until 1915. He and his family lived in Manchester, Vermont, on the Battenkill River of the Green Mountains, which is just up the Appalachian Trail from you guys, up past me, and up in the New England. Uh, he was uh, definitely an entrepreneur, he was an inventor, and he was a high energy guy. Um, New England was full of people like that, and a lot of New Englanders really accomplished a lot during those days, inventing and creating companies. Actually, the Orvis Company was the first mail order catalog company in the United States of America, which is very interesting. So 
Charles Orvis, they say if he were in Massachusetts, he would have been a gun builder. If he were in Pennsylvania, he would have been in a railroad, but he was in Vermont on the Batten Kill. So he was a fly fisherman and he built a, a great company out of that, uh, that passion. He opened a, a tackle shop in 1856. Um, he invented and designed the first Orvis fly reel, which was the first fly reel to have a perforated lighter uh, frame. Um, <clears throat> he was very involved in, in the fly fishing community and he saw the need to establish standards for fine fishing flies. And uh, what he did was uh, he gathered articles from some of the prominent fly fishermen uh, in America, which would have been for the most part in the New England, uh, Pennsylvania up through the Northeast, um, and wrote a book uh, about fly fishing. It was the real, I would say, it was the first real book that uh, focused on flies. It was a fly fishing book, but it had a great focus on flies and fly tying. Um, and also a collection of articles really from across the whole Northeast, even as far away as Alaska. Uh, his book contained 149 paintings of the most popular flies of the day, which was the first time in America that we had a book with uh, over 100 flies in it so that all these fly fishermen from all different regions all over America and a different region back then is different than now. Uh, one region could be um, an area within a horse ride uh, of another region and they would have different flies in those regions. So they, they, uh, they put them in a book and they put names to them. So Americans for the first time had a, an American reference to, to uh, fly, fly tying. He also talked about how to fish the flies, which is interesting. And, and it's always interesting to listen to a fly fisherman talk about how he ties flies because people that spend time in the water want to catch fish. So they learn how to tweak the fly a little bit this way and a little bit that way and a little lighter hues or a little darker hues to make the fly work well for trout. And his book talks about that a lot. But it is a, a very beautiful work of literature. It's a pleasure to read. Uh, people had a much better command of the English language, I think, than we do now. Um, and it's, it's a very beautiful book and it's full of wit, uh, humor and poetry. And I would, I would recommend uh, reading this book. And I'll talk a little later about where you can find some of these books online, free to the public. Uh, so Charles Orvis, the originator of the Orvis Company, he was the father of Mary Orvis, later to become Mary Orvis, Orvis Marbury. Uh, she was one of four children. She was the only one that took an interest in learning how to tie flies. Charles hired a fly tire from Manhattan, New York City to come to Vermont and teach her how to tie flies and she loved it and she took on to it and eventually took over the fly division of the Orvis company and had a studio set up in, in Manhattan to tie flies and she, uh, she lived in a time when the railroad really changed transportation and it changed the uh, culture of fly fishing across America, which allowed people here from the Northeast, which was the majority of the population, to travel as far as Canada, the Rockies, and the West. Um, at that time, outdoor publications and the romance of the wild was a very big thing in the Northeast. And I think people really... Uh, wanted to go and see Maine and see the Catskills and see uh, the Rocky Mountains and Wyoming, Montana, and they, and they did. So there were a number of publications, uh, magazines and catalogs that came out during that time per period. And they really made the sport of fly fishing become very popular and nationally uh, uh, appealing. 
Um, people wanted to fly fish, people wanted to hunt, they wanted to hunt grizzly bear in the Rockies and they wanted to hunt the, the uh, doll sheep in the high peaks and they wanted the brook trout of Rangeley, Maine and they could get there now on train. Um, so Mary and Charles uh, realized that in all the different regions in the United States, the fly patterns uh, were different um, without standards or names. So they sent 200 letters to prominent fly fishermen and tackle shops all over the United States of America asking for um, examples and stories and descriptions about the most popular flies in the area. So they received 206 letters back so Mary wrote a book and it's probably the greatest work of literature in vintage American history on fly fishing. And it's, it's really quite a wonderful book. I, I know a lot of people in my family and, and friends really enjoy looking through the book, even if they're not interested in fly fishing because uh, the, uh, the plates are beautiful. They're very colorful. Um, and let me see if I can show you an example of the book. These are painted plates uh, by, by a, uh, an artist. Uh, they're oil paintings of the flies because back in these days, there were no pictures. In books, all illustrations had to be drawn or painted, and these are actually beautifully done. I know uh, a friend of mine and I talked about, wow, I wonder who painted these these uh, flies because they're so well done. I wonder if they're famous artists. Um, so Mary put together her book. Uh, favorite flies and their histories in 1892. It's 511 pages, 32 painted color plates with 233 trout and salmon flies. Um, so it was by far the, the biggest work of literature and the most descriptive, mainly about flies in America. Um, mainly wet flies and hackles. Uh, there are some that replicate aquatic and land insects, but a large majority of them were attractor wet flies. Uh, big colorful flies with lots of tinsel and flash and colors and silk and big beautiful wings. And a lot of these larger flies were tied on big hooks. Uh, this is actually a fly called the Artful Dodger. Um, <clears throat> that would have been from that era. Uh, that fly would have come from England. And it's, the name is actually referencing an old Dickens uh, novel. Um, you can see the, uh, the golden pheasant, the uh, golden pheasant tippet and crest, the colors, the uh, tinsel, the red and yellow. And brook trout and salmon would, would hit colorful flies like that, and they, they still do today. These flies work very well today. I, I, uh, I do well with them. Um, and if you consider the era when this book was written, it was during the Victorian era in America. So that means that every town, even a small town would have a seamstress, dressmaker, hat makers, hats were big. People didn't go out without their hats and nice dresses and suits on. So a lot of the materials that were used to, to create these flies during the Victorian era, you can see the Victorian era in the the uh, the fly pattern. They were artistically created. Um, they were great uh, for trout fishing and salmon fishing, um, but they also caught fishermen. And I think it was a challenge between fly tires and fly fishermen to tie the most beautiful fly, and they sure did. Um, <clears throat> So a lot of a lot of the flies in, in Mary Orvis's book were attractor flies. Um, some good examples would be the Grizzly King, the Professor, uh, the Silver Doctor. Uh, these are these would all be 
uh, flies that came out of that era that, that are just uh, colorful and beautiful and still work well today. I don't know if anyone has any questions or comments at this point. Sure, Fred? Yes. Hey, it's Wes. Hi, Wes. Good, how you doing? good to get together with you. Yeah, how you doing? Good. Um, yeah, I mean, look at these beautiful streamers just uh, as you know, intrigued me from way on back. Um, hearing about the history of them is, is pretty fascinating, but you know, a lot of us around here uh, grew up with a very simplistic approach to using a top water fly or a beaded nymph, you know? So yes. uh, the one thing I love about <clears throat> following you on uh, Instagram is you show examples of your flies, but you also put them into action and you show them on the stream. Uh, you show them on your rod wet and you show the fish you actually catch with them. So uh, not to get into a fishing lesson, but I'm really interested in uh, you being able to share a little information about us Southern Appalachian fishermen about how to use properly a, a wet fly in relation to, uh, you know, using a top water dry fly or a beaded nymph, that kind of thing. Just a little, a little hint about how you go about using these differently. Sure. Uh, wet flies and streamers traditionally were, were cast uh, upstream and drifted. In other words, you would stand on one edge of a stream or river and cast up and across and let the fly drift down and then you, you swing the fly back toward yourself. Right. Um, Traditionally, they were fished that way quite often. Um, the most popular way to, to fish back in, in the day in America, uh, before nymphing and the dry fly tradition became popular, was the swing. And swinging a wet fly is actually the easiest and the laziest way to fish. And that's probably one of the reasons why I love it. <laughs> to fish. A wet fly is as simple as walking out into a hole or a rapid in a creek or a river and casting your fly out into the current and letting it swing, let the current take the fly and swing down through. Uh, so you could cast out or flick your fly out into the water or an overhead cast, let the current take the fly and then take a swing and then let your, hang, let your fly hang on the end of your line and you can jiggle it a little bit. Uh, and it, that's, that's called a wet fly swing. And it's a very fun, simple way to fish. It's, it's physically easy and it's so relaxing. It's, a, it's, a, it's great for a daydreamer. Um, that's a typical way of doing it. And then what you can do is you can add a foot to your line each cast. Or you can take a step downstream with each cast and cast again and take another step and cast again and to cover a whole pool or a rapid or an area you're fishing. Another way that you can fish them that works really, really well, and I found this out by accident by holding my rod in my arm and looking in my fly box and letting the fly just dangle in the water, letting, letting the fly hang at the end of a, of a run is probably makes up for about 60% of my trout that I catch. Yeah. They, something about that wet fly in the water, swimming back and forth uh, and going up and down in a current, which it will, just drives the trout nuts. And they just, I think they grab it out of aggression and out of uh, instinct. Because instinctively, even if they're not hungry and they're not feeding, the, the sight of something moving through the water like this gets them gets them moving. So that's, that's about it. Now, the other thing you can do is, is quietly, gently walk out into a stream a bit. And you can cast your fly and let it drift down and swing. And then you can take your rod. And here I have my rod right here. I'll show you. If, if I'm standing here now, this is a, an eight foot fly rod. If I'm standing here and I go like this, from left to right, that fly, if I swing it slowly like this, I can swim that fly across the hole 16 feet. 
if I add my arm length to it, it's probably more like 20 feet. So I can swim that fly across the entire stream with a little jiggle and chop pick it up as you're swimming it back across the stream. And then you can add a foot or two foot to it and do it again. And you're exposing the fly to a new, new fish. It's really a fun way to fish. And, and, and it, it's, a, it's an easy way to fish and relaxing too. You get to really enjoy it. Thanks. Sounds like it's made for me, you know? <laughs> well, it's really it's, a lot like it's a lot like using a nymph in a way uh, where you let a lot the stream basically do a lot of the work. Yes. Yeah. But, it's 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 a you you hear a lot about uh, in old literature and something I've always valued very much is the art of the drift. Really being in touch with your fly line and your leader and where your fly is and picturing what it's doing under the water in the current, you really get in touch with what the fly's doing in the water uh, versus a tight line or fishing with an indicator or a dry dropper fly. Uh, you lose some of that. Um, and and, it, and it is a, it's, it's, a, it's an art form and it's very enjoyable. I really recommend it to anyone. And um, I was just gonna show, uh, share, a screen of your Instagram page because it, uh, it illustrates what Wes was just talking about, how it's got some great photos uh, of, he, of you here fishing and then also catching the trout with the different flies. So here's pictures of you with a, a blue professor wet fly and you got a, um, there's the beautiful blue professor on your, re uh, like on your handle and then uh, seeing the wild brown trout grab onto it. So that's really exciting. And I mean, your, your photography skills are just incredible. So were you a photographer first and then a fly tire or a fly tire who learned how to become a photographer? <laughs> well, uh, my, dad was a, my dad was a photographer. He was really, really into photography. And um, I, being an outdoorsman of my whole life, uh, back, you know, before we had all these, um, cameras and movies in our pocket, or uh, video recorders in our pocket. You know, I would spend a lot of time out outdoors in the mountains and rivers and streams. And, and I, I just remember always wanting to, I, I always felt like it was just too beautiful uh, to just to keep to myself. And I wanted to share it with people. And of course my sons would go with me and, and we would enjoy together and, and friends. But I remember when I, um, I, I was always, always appreciated photography, but uh, this was a way for me to share what I was seeing and experiencing with other people so they could enjoy the scenes. And, and uh, it's just been a real pleasure for me. Oh, definitely. And you capture some just beautiful images of, uh, of places that you're able to go and of the flies that you tie. Um, I thought it was really interesting, just the history that you gave us today um, with talking about uh, Thaddeus and um, how even his writings in the 19th century were talking about the importance of con water conservation. Yes. And, uh, it seems that um, out outdoorsmen and uh, hunters and fishermen and fisherwomen have been uh, really kind of the tip of the spear in a lot of environmental conservation movements throughout Americans, America's history. Um, so that's really just wonderful that people were recognizing that even in the early days of industrialization in America. Oh my gosh, I, I can tell you, and, and it's so interesting, I, I'm a reader and I, I've been a, a reader all my life and I I, I really appreciate old literature. I, I feel that the, the old uh, authors uh, were so descriptive. I just loved the English back then and, and brilliant people. We think of people of, of back in the day, you know how everyone thinks their parents aren't as smart as them? Well, you think back in the day, well, my grandparents, my great grandparents are back in the Civil War or the American Revolution. You think of them as just old fashioned old timers. If you pick up and read their literature and really absorb what they're saying, they were brilliant people. So I, I spent a lot of time reading uh, old literature. Um, for example, this is 
something I'm working through right now. This is an outdoor life from uh, 19, 1911. And it's full of, of information about outdoorsmen and fly fishermen and hunters. And I, I pour through these, I really enjoy them. But I, I, I'm really impressed with the effort put into restoring the streams and rivers back, well, this is Thaddeus Norris is in the 1860s, his, his book was published. But in, in Pennsylvania, uh, the millions of dollars and people passionately pouring their lifetime and physical energy into restoring, cleaning up mines and, and pollution. And today we have streams that were polluted and dead, even through when I was a kid, you wouldn't dream of fishing there. And they're cleaning them up. And we're seeing a, a, a huge restoration that started back in the 1920s, 30s, and 40s. And those guys knew that they were never going to see the benefits of this in their life, but someday someone will. And now we are. And I, I think it's really wonderful. Mm -hmm. The yeah. effort. Oh, yes, that effort and then how they're doing it so future generations can appreciate their passion that, and share that with them. And um, so I'm a musician. And I just one thing that I get from playing older songs is this feeling of kind of communing with people who are no longer around and that you're having the shared experience with them. So yeah. could you kind of speak to the, um, the feelings that you get about, you know, tying these traditional patterns and kind of keeping that tradition alive? Oh, what a great question. Um, I remember the first fishing fly that I saw when my parents, we moved from Philly and my dad bought an old stone farmhouse that was built in the mid 1700s. And it had a spring house and a pond with brook trout and it was all woods around us, no neighbors. It was a wonderful place to grow up. But I remember going downstairs and there was a workbench and there were three beautiful flies. And I think one was a parmesine bell, one was a grizzly king, and I can't remember the other one. And they were sitting there from the previous owner. And I thought, my goodness, is that beautiful. And of course I knew there were fishing flies from my dad was an outdoorsman, so I had read all, all the old magazines and literature, and I was just sucked into it ever since then. I, I, I saw it as a tradition connecting with our past and the roots and heritage of the outdoors, the great outdoors, and, and uh, with reading for when, when I was, when I was uh, growing up as a kid, if I wanted to read about anything, I would have to go to a library and get books on the subject. And most of the libraries that I could go to had very, very, very old books. So a lot of them are even out of date now, but they were like Ray Bird's, Bergman Straub and, and uh, the Orvis books and Thaddeus Norris. So the old literature in the libraries was all I had access to. And I read about this stuff as a kid and, and it just, I guess it does connect you to a little bit more of a wholesome time and maybe uh, uh, the passion of the of the past and the authors of the old day. You know, and it's neat because, you know, I, I travel up to Maine quite a bit in New England to fly fish. And uh, I go in some of the fly shops up there and the bins are loaded with classic fly patterns and streamers, traditional stuff, uh, Herb Welch and Carrie Stevens and wet fly patterns, you know, and it's just, you know, it's a, it's a whole different era of fly fishing that um, I think it's, I think it's the, the artistry of it, uh, the, uh, the passion of the people back then and, and how beautiful the flies are. Um, and it's, it's really cool to tie them and experience how well they work and learning the ins and outs of, fishing, the old traditional methods, uh, takes time, experience, trial and error. And over the years I've learned and I, I just love it. It's all, it's all I do. My, my flies, uh, I fish everything that's pre-World War II, uh, dating back to like the Kaki Bandu, which was around the 1600s. And uh, my, the, the fly equipment that I fish with is like this rod, this is a fly rod I just 
started using it's a this this is a Martin reel from the 1950s. This is a Wright and McGill fiberglass eight foot fly rod from the 50s, and the line is pure braided silk from uh, the 1930s, restored. And you would pick this up and think, oh, that's really old stuff, and it must be a real junker and a clunker. But well, to what a sweet cast and beautifully working fly line and rig, and I just enjoy it. Mm -hmm. It's kind of it's kind of like uh, it's just fun to see how they did things and how well it works. Yeah, and uh, well, you alluded to it earlier, just with the beauty of the language of the writers and their knowledge of the previous generations. And it just seems that, you know, in those older times in the previous centuries, people had a much more intimate connection with the land and with yeah. the wildlife around them. And so, so many things about fly fishing and being a good angler have to deal with observation and trial and error and observing what flies are hatching off at that time and what fish are biting on what things. So if anything, you know, the people from those older times before all the distractions that we have today, you know, were so much more in tune with what was going on. And, uh, you know, I can see how their knowledge is still rings true today. Oh my gosh, yeah. Well, they, if you consider, if you consider how much time they had uh, to, to work on their trade or their craft or their art or their skill. They did not have electronics. They had, did not have televisions. Uh, largely didn't even have radio. So doing things in the outdoors was a big part of people's lives. And the, the other part of it is uh, these people did this stuff to survive also. Um, hunting and fishing and trapping was a means of survival for people. And so it goes a little deeper than just sport. It would have been something that would have put dinner on the table for your children, and your wife that night, you know. And I think that was always the draw of, and as, as society became more domesticated and less physical and more uh, centered on, on, on iPhones and televisions and media, um, I think fly fishing is a, a means of keeping us in touch with instincts that we have to be in the outdoors and appreciate the the beauty of, of creation and um, to get outside and get your blood pumping and, and see the, the wildlife uh, on the river and stream and I don't know anyone that doesn't go out for a day on the river not feeling like they did something really neat and really really wholesome and good and um, so I think that's a way of keeping us connected with, with things that people would do on, on any given day years ago. Oh, it, it definitely is a, a timeless act. And um, I just, you know, I'm so grateful that there are people like you that are preserving these traditions uh, for the future. And I'm um, doing such a good job documenting it. And then so um, one of the things I want to do before we just like kind of open the forum up for uh, any more Q and A is just to show folks your website. Um, just because I was just so impressed that not only are your pictures incredible, like we saw on um, your Instagram, but you can go to grizzlykingfly.com and celebrate the art and history of fly tying with Fred. And he's also got Streamside Journal. And yeah, you're just I really enjoy your writings. Um, and so it's just another way where you really you the way you write kind of brings you to that place. And oh, thank uh, you. it helps you really appreciate it. And so I get that, the sense of awe and wonder that you have for the outdoors and it shines through in your writing. And so you thank can you. see such incredible pictures. And I just have to ask the name Grizzly King Fly, uh, where, what made you kind of settle on that? Uh, <clears throat> the Grizz Grizzly King is a, a very old traditional pattern that dates back to England. Uh, I've always thought of it as a beautiful fly from a romantic era and it really works well and it has always been my favorite fishing fly. It still is. And uh, when uh, some years ago when I started putting my pictures online and writing, I was looking for a name other than just my name. So I wanted to include Grizzly King. 
fly and, and it went from there mm -hmm. yeah well it's a it's a great name beautiful fly and that's just so wonderful too that it connects back to that story about your youth when you moved to that farmhouse and is one of those flies on the wall thank you mm -hmm. Well, um, yeah, I've really enjoyed this insight into the history of fly tying, Fred, and I appreciate your time. Um, so, yeah, if anybody else has any questions or comments for Fred, this is a great time. Okay. To... Uh, Fred, I, I thank you for doing this. And uh, I really enjoyed, or got, was fascinated by the book, The, Fe the Feather Thief. And, yes. uh, I, and uh, I wondered if any of the feathers you were showing were, had any of the exotic bird feathers in them. <laughs> um they don't uh my flies uh most of the flies that i tie were typical american uh flies i have to be very careful because some of the patterns include feathers from bird species that would be illegal to use the feathers from now because of the wild bird act to protect wild birds um but i'm familiar with some of these feathers and I do know some people that probably did have some of these feathers in their possession, but I won't name their names. <laughs> but yeah, what a great book. Yeah, very interesting. Thank you very much for doing, doing this uh, history. You're welcome. Thank you. <clears throat> yeah, Fred, uh, Fred reminded me a while back, <clears throat> luckily, that even salvaging the feathers from a deceased raptor in the middle of the road is something you don't want to do. <laughs> yeah. Even though I, had, I had studied that many years back and, and knew that was uh, an issue, I'd forgotten about that. And uh, it certainly makes sense, um, particularly when we have bald eagles flying up and down Wilson Creek now and things like that. that uh, but I've, I've really enjoyed uh, seeing you in action today and really hope we can get you down here and in touch with some of the local fishing groups. And uh, let me show you the areas that we fish and the conservation project that we're working on and I'm working on on Wilson Creek, um, which again, history never changes. In some ways, we're still fighting trash and pollution and abuse and uh, yeah. You know, we'll probably always be doing that, but uh, I really do appreciate you doing this today. Well, it was good talking to you, Wes, and I'm I'm definitely going to get down there to go fishing with you guys and, and see that. I've, I've been down there, and I know that part of the Appalachian Mountains is just beautiful. I'd love to see it. And I know you have some nice brook trout down there, too. Dude, yep. That's great. I look forward to it. Yeah, me too. <laughs>